Well, I probably need to disclose something right before I start. I am not an expert on parenting. I um, have about eight years of experience. My wife and I have been parenting our daughter almost eight years. At the end of uh, February, she'll turn eight. And, um, but those of you who know, it, it's a scary thing. Um, and I used to work at the hospital. I, I know when, when they used to take new babies out to the cars and they'd go out there with them and they'd have to check to make sure their car seat was right. They won't put it in for you, but they make sure it's there. And, and I was amazed how many people would like break down crying at the car side. Ah, what am I going to do now? I got this baby. I can't even put a car seat in. How can I care for this child? You know, don't they come with an owner's manual or something? And hopefully, maybe you have somebody that can help you along the way, but it's scary. Um, and if I'm honest, and if most new parents are honest, they probably really struggle and feel inadequate a lot of the time and doubt, um, doubt themselves as parents. And I doubt I'm the only one in this room today that's felt that way ever. So today, as I preach this sermon, hear it not just to you, but here it, I'm also preaching it partially to myself as well. Well, as we get uh, started, there are three realities we need to remember about parenting. Uh, living as a family is messy. Duh. If you've ever been a part of one, you know that much. Uh, parenting is hard work. Again, you know that. And there is no par- perfect model for how to be a parent. The reason I chose today's scripture from Proverbs was because it's a helpful reminder uh, that if there's any hope for us, Uh, For any hope for me or any hope for you as parents, it can only come from God. Hear those words again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. It's sometimes uh, translated strength. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make make straight your paths. It's reassuring to remember that we can trust God uh, will direct us as parents. And he will provide us with what we require to be the family uh, for our children that they need. Unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of obstacles out there that kind of get in the way of our uh, parenting. Uh, One of the biggest obstacles is something I'm going to call today the perfect family syndrome. Uh, You know, you all have a picture in your mind of what the perfect family looks like. It might look something like one of these pictures up here. It might look like something totally different. But we all have some uh, vision in our minds. And that puts incredible pressure on us to measure up to this thing we've got in our mind. What typically results is a feeling of discouragement and disappointment. But what if instead of feeling these feelings of uh, discouragement and disappointment uh, by the perfect picture in our minds or the so-called perfect family that we always think think lives next door? You know, some families maybe are just better hiding it than others that they're a mess too. But anyway, uh, that's a whole other sermon. Uh, What if we were just honest with ourselves that this is probably just not the picture of our family that's real, but we are a real family, and it's okay to be who we are. Uh, Real families have always been the most fertile ground for God to work in powerful ways. Just take a look at Scripture, and you'll recognize there aren't a whole lot of examples of functional families. Just think about it for a second. In the Bible, there are not many functional families. Let's just run through a few you might be familiar with. Noah had a drinking problem. Abraham offered his wife to another man. Jacob's sons sold their brother into slavery. That's kind of harsh. David had an affair. You know, some of you don't like your brothers and sisters, but goodness, sell them into slavery? Wow. Anyway, David had an affair. Eli lost control of his boys in church. Not any of you. I know that never happened. You know, kids going nuts and crawling under the pews and stuff. No, never happened. That's just to name a few things. And don't forget, the Holy Family themselves lost Jesus for three days. Do you remember that? And then they found him later on hanging out in the temple. So the Bible is full of motley crew families just like you and like mine. You know, ours, the Bible's full of families like us. And that should give you hope. I know it gives me hope. God seems far more interested in using broken people than he is in creating and maintaining some perfect picture of what a family is. As Reggie Joyner Joyner observes in his book, that one we're going to do this little study on, Parenting Beyond Your Capacity, it's as though God is saying, I'm going to use churches and families, both, both who are composed of broken people, as platforms to demonstrate to the world that I am a God of restoration 
and redemption. Rather than drawing a perfect picture of what families should be, God wants to use our families to show us what it means to have an authentic, everyday faith with God who redeems and restores broken people. Unrealistic pictures of what a family should be, you know, that can just paralyze us as parents and drain our energy instead of, building, instead of giving us those things to build up our capacity to parent our children well. Joyner again writes, we can buy into the myth that we have to make more lists, get more eg- organized, uh, work much harder, and never make mistakes in order to be successful parents. But that's not helpful. What instead we should do is we need to remember that our influence has more to do with our relationships with our children than it does our skills as parents. You know, your purpose as a parent is not to get skilled at parenting to build relationships with your children or perhaps your grandchildren or other kids that you come into contact with regularly. Wanting to be a great parent is a good and noble thing. And nobody, just because of the hours that you get to spend with your kids at other places, don't. You have a chance to be the biggest impact on your child's life. You know, the babysitter, uh, the school, uh, your t- kids' coaches, they don't spend as much time. They don't have as access to your as you do. You're the only one that has that ability to make the greatest impact. But you cannot, and you should not even try to do it alone. Being a parent is far too big of a job to do successfully all on your own. No matter how gifted you are, None of us have enough capacity to be everything that our kids need us to be. So if that's all true, then what? Um, well, take a look at this picture of a, a lever, lever and a folk or all, whatever the heck. I don't know. I'm, I'm using it as a lever. See the thing in the middle, which may be a fulcrum, it may be a pivot point, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Some of you out there are math people and care. Ah, it's an illustration, I don't care. So anyway, uh, the closer you move that pivot point to the, to the weight, the easier it gets to lift, right? You've all seen this before. You know, you, teeter-totter is a good example of this. Um, and so there's some pivot points as parents that can help us to be, um, to help us lift this heavy load of being a parent. Those pivot points are our, a relationship with you, a relationship with God, and a relationship with others. If we have those three things, uh, then we're going to be helping, that's, those things are going to help us to be the parents that God is calling us to be for our children. A relationship with you builds love and trust, which is critical. Out of that relationship, then you gain credibility and access, which allows you to help shape your child's relationship with God. And then the last pivot point is where all of us collectively come in. So wake up out there if you don't aren't a kid or a youth and you're not a parent. Listen, this is for you now, okay? We're all in this together. It allows a community of caring adults to do what God has already called them to do and fill a space for your child that a parent simply cannot do all on their own. This need for all of us to unite in raising our children is nothing new, but it's something that we a lot of times forget. We think with that perfect parent thing again, we think, I got to do it myself. And if I can't do it myself, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to Google it. I'm going to go to the library. I'm going to get a big stack of books on parenting. There's a whole... There's like a whole wing, practically, on parenting books. It's a cottage industry. So if you ever want to write a book, there you go. But anyway, that's where you go. And you try to fill yourself with all these ideas that somehow this is going to do the trick and get you. This is nothing new. But um, we forget that it's not meant to be done on your own. And it is not just dependent upon your capacity Back in the Old Testament, after Moses led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, they spent 40 years wandering around out in the desert, out in the wilderness, before entering the promised land. And during that time, God provided um, bread from heaven. He provided manna that fell down every single day and provided for their sustenance so that they would have something to eat and endure this time of 40 years while they were wandering around. Because of that daily connection and that daily dependence on God, the people trusted in God to take care of them no matter what. But Moses knew, excuse me, he knew, I need some water. (laughs) I get a little riled up sometimes. Anyway, Moses knew that there was a transition coming, coming. Once 
the people went into the promised land, things would be different. No longer would they depend on God for their food. They'd start growing it and raising it themselves. They knew, he knew that then they wouldn't just be this intertwined uh, community, that they would then be intermingled with other people who didn't think and believe in their God. So he made a wonderful proclamation to all the people recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In this pivotal moment in Israel's history, Moses speaks to the entire nation and he calls everyone to be responsible for how the next generation will be raised. He doesn't leave anybody out of the circle. He doesn't say, hey, you guys over there be parents and everybody else go sit over there on the beach, okay? No, he says it's all of our responsibilities. Moses realized that God chose the family and the community of faith as the two entities who would tell the story of God to the next generation. So the good news is that we're not alone. We're in this mess together. So to get another visual in your head, big circle there. And inside of this circle is all the people who live at your house, your immediate family. Uh, here's where parents and children interact and build loving and trusting relationships. As parents, you know, we, we may wish that we could be the ones who provide everything for our children's needs to navigate the world inside of this little circle. But some things are simply beyond a parent's capacity to do. Here's a sobering thought for you. Your present family will never be enough for your child, and you are not the only influence your child needs. That statement is both frightening and freeing. What we need to do is widen this circle. There you go. <laughs> That's a really widened circle. Anyway, you need to widen the circle. And you need to include other people in your child's lives who can speak into their lives and offer them wisdom and love and care. Uh, because there's going to be times where you're not able to do that. Because uh, you might be too close. Reggie Joyner tells a story about his teenage son to illustrate this point. <laughs> Some of you could probably relate to this. Uh, his son was uh, out past curfew one night and he came in. And so uh, Reggie confronted him and said, hey, uh, you know, you're late. Uh, can you please tell me what you've been doing all night? Uh, you know, and the son just said, I'd rather not talk about it. <laughs> well, as a parent, I know you know that doesn't go over real well, you know. Uh, you can't just tell me, no, I'm your parent, you know. Uh, pulled the parent card. So he said, well, uh, you don't really don't have an option. You need to tell me what you've been doing, everything that's happened tonight. And he said, then his son stared him right in the eye and he said, no, I am not going to tell you that. And so then Reggie, you know, being the smart parent he was, the full frontal attack was not working, so I'm going to come around the side, and I'm going to say, son, it's me. You know I love and care about you. There's nothing you could tell me that would ever change that. Ever said that before? I need you to tell me what's going on because I'm your father. And then his son said, no, you don't understand, dad. I'm not going to tell you because you are my dad and you make the rules. Well, Reggie decided at that point to go to bed because he was going to get angry and upset. So he just went to bed. The next day he woke up and he went and talked to one of his friends and he was relaying this story, trying to calm himself down from the night before. And as he was telling the story, his friends started chuckling and smiling at him. And as you know, parents, when you're wanting some sympathy from your friends, you know, and they start laughing at you. It doesn't really make you feel real good. But anyway, he goes, Reggie, did you tell your dad everything? Well, of course not. None of us tell, have told our parents everything. Even as adults, you probably still haven't told all the skeletons you've got running around in your kid closet. You know, we just don't do that. So when Reggie got home that evening, he went to his son's room and he said, I didn't tell my dad everything either. 
And I really am trying to be okay with not knowing what's going on with you all the time. But I have another question for you. If you won't tell me, then who will you tell? If you won't tell me, who will you tell? And his son's answer was easy. He said, Dad, that's fair. I'll tell you who. I'll talk to Kevin. And Reggie recalled as soon as his son said Kevin, that he felt a huge sense of relief because Kevin had been a trusted family friend for years. Kevin loved Reggie's family. He wanted the best for them. And he knew that he'd be a safe person for his son to confide in. So my question is, do you, does your child have a Kevin? If you ask them today, if you won't tell me, then who will you tell? Would they be able to give you a name? A time will come when your child needs another adult besides you. No matter how good of a parent you are, you cannot be everything for your child. A parent's influence is best realized in partnership with a wider community. We have to remember a parent's influence is best, or sorry, I just said that. Uh, and if that's the case, then all of you who don't have kids, or maybe whose kids have left home and are out on their own, uh, those who are grandparents, this is where you really step into the gap. You know, every time we baptize a child like we did this morning, we commit to join with the child's parents in providing a community of love and support. And as a parent, I believe this is one of the greatest values of the church is its potential to provide a community for our children. You know, widening the circle involves pursuing strategic relationships for our sons and daughters. This becomes more and more important too as they get older uh, because they need more adult voices speaking into their lives. And when we take on these partners and trust God has created us to share in these responsibilities for raising up our children, then some of the pressure of parenting is relieved and some of the joy of parenting is restored. When we widen the circle, the goal is to have other trusted adults in the lives of our children before they need them so that when they need them, they are there. You know, we are widening the circle for our kids here uh, in our congregation, you know, we have our Orange Express uh, children's ministry leaders who are small group leaders are with the children for the whole school year. So they have that consistent adult presence. You know, we have uh, our confirmation mentors who meet one-on-one -on -one with their confirmands for four uh, months and then follow them afterwards and stay connect with them to share the love of Christ. And then yesterday, I got to experience the middle school uh, winter retreat and ski trip, and I got to see firsthand some of the student ministry volunteers and leaders who are investing in our children there. You know, if your child cannot name their Kevin or their Cody or their Jody or their Janelle or their Tom or their Michael or uh, their Jean Marie or whoever, then make fostering those relationships a priority. Well, I always feel better when I realize that I'm not alone as a parent, you know, that when I hear other people's uh, war stories that, you know, yeah, we're st I struggle with that too, and, and you can kind of commiserate with one another. Um, and even sometimes when I do something right, I still kind of doubt my, uh, myself and wonder if I really am uh, getting any better at this. Uh, because I never seem to have enough patience or enough time or enough energy or enough space uh, to be the kind of parent I, I think I should be. But the reality is that we all make mistakes as parents. You know, most of us can think of things we wish we would have, could have done over. Uh, times when frustration or anger clouded our judgment and we made decisions that were based on the immediate circumstances and we kind of totally forgot about the bigger picture you know, many of us, though, then wake up one day and realize we've economized on the very relationships we vowed that we would make a priority. I think this reactive um, parenting happens most often when we forget 
uh, that parenting does not come primarily from our own strength. You know, back to Moses' proclamation for a second. The first phrase known as the Shema says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, the Lord is one. You know, it's in this affirmation that God is God that we are reminded we can trust God with our children. When we are feeling defeated or afraid as parents, it is good to remember that God is there in the midst of every circumstance. When we realize that God is God and he is always working to bring restoration and hope to our families, then we can be freed to focus on what matters most, building positive and loving relationships with our children. Sometimes we think simply spending more time will cure all that ails our relationships. But just being together does not substitute for interacting together in a meaningful way. You know, time alone will not get the job done. The time you spend together with your children needs to be focused and deliberate and consistent. You know, when your kids are thinking back uh, about their childhood later on, they're not going to sit there with some sort of, uh, you know, Excel spreadsheet that shows the number of hours that you spent with them. But they will remember the meaningful, life-giving, quality times that they had with you. You know, if you want to develop a better relationship, a deeper relationship with your child, the best thing that you can do is increase the quantity of quality time you spend together. You know, we're all busy, and it can feel like we're kind of passing in the night a lot of the time. To facilitate an increased quantity of quality time, we need to somehow establish a family rhythm. You know, something that works for our family so that we don't miss out on opportunities to have an impact on our children's lives. You know, Moses suggested a rhythm of faith and life developed, uh, development in our passage from Deuteronomy. He said, keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk to them when you're at home and when you're away and when you lie down and when you rise up. You know, bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and, forehead and write them down on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You know, this highlights a rhythm of sharing your deepest convictions about God and life with your children while also strengthening and deepening your relationship. You know, our Orange curriculum uh, that we use for Orange Express uh, Children's Ministry suggests that uh, we all create some sort of family rhythm, and they suggest um, four strategic times of day that most people have in common, and it is a place that you can find a little bit of time even if you're really busy. Most days you can find this little bit of time. Uh, Those times are meal time, drive time, bedtime, and morning time. And by leveraging these times, we can build and deepen our relationships with our children in profound ways. You know, as you can see on this uh, graph up here, uh, each time of day features types of conversations and roles that you can play, which naturally draw you closer to your child. You know, nothing on that list up there is particularly difficult, but it does help us to be deliberate and consistent in making quality time with our kids. For instance, up there on meal time, you know, that's a time where you can have more formal discussions, where you can teach your children and establish what you value as as a family. You can talk about, you know, why we give, why we serve, you know, why we treat people the way that we do. You can give them a bigger worldview than maybe uh, they would have otherwise. You know, at drive time, you know, we all drive our kids here and there and everywhere. You know, grandparents, you a lot of times get pulled into the mix to help with that. And so I know you all have times where you're in the car with your kids and it's easy to just let them watch a video on the video player or listen to music and not have a conversation. Uh, But maybe instead, look at those times, the time just for those informal conversations where they can ask you questions, where you can ask them questions, uh, where you can hear what their interests are. You know, uh, my daughter loves books, and so she tells me about her books, you know, when we're in the car. I don't really care about some of these books. But it's interesting uh, to hear how her mind is working and why she thinks they're interesting. And then I like them because of that fact, because they're important to her. Um, Bedtime. Um, It's a time where you can have intimate conversations, where you can um, share some time with each other to pray for yourselves and pray for your family, pray for the world. 
Um, you know, that's one of my favorite times. Uh, my daughter, she's getting really long now, so, but she always likes me to carry her upstairs to go to bed. So I pick her up and, and take her up. And, uh, you know, then I sit on the side of her bed and make sure she's tucked in, make sure she has her water, make sure she has her, her animals all the way she wants them and everything. But then we just have an opportunity just to talk, just, you know, daddy and Emma time. And it's one of the best times of my day. And then morning time, which a lot of times we look at it kind of throwing away time because we're busy trying to get kids ready and get them fed and get them out the door, make sure they don't forget their homework or if the dog ate it, get it out of the dog's mouth and get it where it needs to go, whatever it is. And it's often frantic and it's often disjointed. Um, when I taught first grade, I knew the kids had had a bad morning the second they walked in the door because their bad morning continued into the classroom, let me tell you. Uh, your kids' parents know when you have a bad morning, too. Um, but I also knew when the kids had a good morning, when somebody at home took a moment with them to kind of focus them on what they were going to do that day uh, and build a little excitement in them for learning and encourage them as they walked out the door. Uh, we can all do those things in those little bitty time frames, uh, and it can really make a meaningful impact on your children's lives. You know, parenting is one of the most difficult and rewarding important and important jobs in the whole world. Never underestimate the impact that you can make on children. It's an amazing thing that God has chosen the family and the church to reveal his restoration and renewal of the world. This is a great gift, and it's also a great responsibility. And when the church and family work together, we can have a far greater impact than either can have working alone. So this is my prayer for you all today. As you leave this place, trust in God to love you always. Trust in him to help you widen the circle and provide you with partners to walk beside you and your child. Trust in him to provide you with a family rhythm where you can increase the quantity of the quality time you spend with your child and know that you are never alone. May God richly bless you in the grand parenting adventure and bless us all as we reveal God's love to our children. Amen.